Good morning, everyone. This is Director Bashotsky. It is 8 a.m. I want to call to order the meeting of the Governor's Water Augmentation, Innovation, and Conservation Council. Please be reminded that this meeting is now being recorded. Before we move to introductions, I will ask Kennedy Shepard to briefly review the webinar logistics. And thank you for all of you doing this so early in the morning. It certainly helped out us and some other folks logistically. So Kennedy, can you go through the logistics for us, please? Thank you, Mr. Bushatsky. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Please be sure to mute yourself when you are not speaking. If you are not a member of the council, we also ask that you keep your video turned off. If members of the council would like to speak, please Please type your name in the chat box and we will call you in the order your name appears to unmute and speak. You may also type your questions in the chat if you prefer. Please send your messages to everyone in the chat so we don't overlook them. Members of the public may be invited to submit questions or comments at the end of the agenda as time allows. If that is the case, we ask that you please hold your questions or comments until invited then either type your question or comment in the chat or indicate in the chat if you would like to speak. As the chair stated, this meeting and the conversations in the chat are being recorded. The recording is usually posted to the ADWR website within one to two business days. If council members or members of the public experience any technical difficulties, you may contact us directly in the chat as ADWR host, or you can call our help desk at 602-771 8444 or email them at tickets at azwater.gov. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kennedy. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, as I said before, I'm Director Bashotsky. With me today in DWR conference room are Chuck Podolak, Natural Resources Policy Advisor to Governor Ducey, Carol Ward, AEDWR Deputy Assistant Director for Planning and Permitting, Kennedy Shepard, as you already heard, the AMA groundwater users from the AMA staff, and also um, John Riggins, who recently moved from compliance to working with Carol, and Natalie Mast, our Active Management Plan Coordinator. Also, Clint Chandler, our Deputy Director, with that, I'm going to ask Kennedy to call the roll for the council alphabetically. Please be prepared to unmute yourself and acknowledge that you are present. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Bishotsky. Bas Aha. Director Lisa Atkins. Thank you. Representative Reginald Bolding. David Brown. I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Director Mizell Cabrera. Good morning, everyone. Chris Camacho. Ted Cook. Present. Thank you. Maria Dadgar. Good morning. This is Jay Tomkis, alternate for Maria Dadgar. Thank you. Henry Day. Present. Ron Doba. Good morning. Ron Doba is present. Thank you. Doug Dunham. Sandy Fabritz. Present. Thank you. Kathleen Ferris. Chairwoman Amelia Flores. Grady, Grady Gamage. I am here. Thank you. William Garfield. Present. Representative Gail Griffin. Present. Thank you. 
Spencer Camp. Jamie Kelly. Good morning, I am present. Thank you. Senator Sina Kerr. Present. Thank you. John Kameek. Present. Cheryl Lombard. Edward Maxwell. Present. Thank you. Supervisor Steve Miller. Present. Wade Noble. I am here. Thank you. Virginia O'Connell. Present. Senator Lisa Otondo. Chuck Podolak. Present. Sarah Porter. Here. Good morning. Thank you. Dave Roberts. Stephen Rowe Lewis. Kevin Rogers. Scott Dini. Stephanie Smallhouse. Present. Mark Smith. Present. Craig Sullivan. Warren Tenney. Good morning, here. Okay. Timothy Tomier. Present. Philip Townsend. Present. Christopher Udall. Jay Wenton. That is all the council members. Margaret Vick is here on behalf of Amelia Flores for Colorado River Indian Tribes. Thank you. Also, Kathy Ferris, council member. And this we saw, I saw house. Craig Sullivan's face earlier, so I assume Craig is there, although he did not answer. I uh, also this want is... at this time to uh, ask any other elected officials that we may have missed who are present today, if you would like to unmute yourself and introduce yourself, uh, now would be the time, and I'll pause to see if there are any other elected officials. Hearing none, we will move on then, and if we could call up the slide for the agenda first. So this is the agenda that we sent out to everybody, but with my prerogative of the chair, we decided to change the order uh, to make this more efficient, and also there are some folks who wanted to be here for some of the conversation who let us know they would be a little bit late. So the new order is going to be starting out with a report on the fifth management plans, then a discussion of the council annual report, then we will get into the committee updates. So go to the slide please for the fifth management plan update. Thank you, so uh, again, Natalie Mass will provide an update on where we are with the process and how we intend to proceed to meet our tight timeline. And again, we, I think most of you know, we have a very aggressive timeline to complete the promulgation of the fourth management plans. Uh, similarly, in the fifth management plan process, we have a very tight timeline to be able to get the plans adopted and effective in 2025. So I will turn it over to Natalie and we'll take questions perhaps at the end of Natalie's presentation. Thank you, Director, and thank you to the Council for having me here this morning. 
My name is Natalie Mast. I am the AMA director responsible for the management plans here at ADWR. Uh, and I'm here today to provide an update on the fifth management plans process and timeline. You'll hear a couple themes from me today. Um, uh, like Director Bushatsky just said, we are on an aggressive timeline, but we're still working diligently to provide opportunity and space to have the needed conversations to develop the requirements for the fifth management plans. And second, that th this process is different than previous management plans, but also our world is different and our methods and opportunities for engagement are different and uh, this process can be and has been productive and functional. Uh, so first, a uh, high level view. Um, in the summer of 2019, we set a target of adopting the remaining fourth management plans by the end of 2020 and having the fifth management plans become effective by 2025. Uh, for the fourth management plans, I'm very happy to share that we did achieve that goal of adopting those remaining three fourth management plans, uh, Pinal, uh, Phoenix, and Santa Cruz by the end of 2020. And the conservation requirements in those plans will go into effect on January 1st, 2023. At the same time, in the summer of 2019, we created the fifth management plans work group and a stakeholder process for developing the fifth management plans. The timeline slide you see here is familiar for many of you. I think I've used this slide nearly every time I've presented over the last year, so the message here isn't, isn't new. We have an aggressive timeline and there are certainly a lot of resources and attention needed and significant challenges to meeting that timeline. Uh, but it is a timeline that we need to meet and we deeply appreciate the extensive time that stakeholders across the sectors have spent working alongside us to meet this timeline. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is brand new. What you see here is a more detailed version of that familiar timeline slide. There's a lot here and I'll be working through the three sections here throughout the rest of my presentation this morning. So we'll come back to this slide, but for now we're gonna focus on the first section on the left under 2020 development. I already mentioned and many of you have participated in the management plans work group. That group was created with public involvement and transparency in mind. And while a pandemic and a shift to virtual meetings have certainly forced us to do things very differently um, and to be creative in our methods, we have held over 30 meetings of that work group um, or of the various subgroups with countless side conversations, individual discussions, and with additional public meetings through the Groundwater User Advisory Councils, or GUACs, in each AMA, and through the Ag BMP Advisory Committee. There have been hundreds of people involved in these meetings, and there has been a broad and productive discussion, engagement, and opportunity for consideration and feedback throughout this process. Uh, that engagement has built on and added to the learning and analysis and collaboration that has really guided the development of many of the proposals for the conservation requirements in the fifth management plan. Next slide, please. The authority for the conservation programs in the management plans comes from the groundwater code and statute. So it should come as no surprise that our guiding principle throughout this process has come from the statute that you see on the screen. And many of you have heard me quote this dozens of times now. Uh, the Groundwater Code created a structure for a series of five management plans for each AMA, which contain conservation programs designed to reduce withdrawals of groundwater. Uh, the work group and its subgroups have been enormously productive. We have made significant progress in the development of the fifth management plans, but there is still a lot of work ahead of us. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the progress that has been made over the course of many discussions that I mentioned has been documented on the 5MP Concepts webpage. 
This page includes a drop down for each sector or category and provides summaries of the concepts proposed for the fifth management plans, including interactive data, links to meeting recordings, stakeholder comments, and other tools. The intent of this site and many of the other methods we've used throughout this process is to provide multiple opportunities to access information, provide input, consider concepts, or ask questions and have additional discussions. The goal has been lots of interaction, um, and this can be seen through the various methods in meetings, in the surveys provided in each meeting, through the summaries, calculators and dashboards available on this concepts page, and in the ability to contact myself or our management plan staff anytime via our group email at managementplans at azwater.gov. Next slide, please. In the municipal subgroup, we have made significant updates to the non per capita program, um, the BMP list, the, the points requirements for that program. And we continue to develop the details for a GPCD proposal that can be more realistic and responsive while still achieving additional conservation or reductions in withdrawals of groundwater as I pointed to previously. Next slide, please. In our turf group, we've developed detailed proposals for golf courses and other types of turf facilities like parks, schools, HOAs, and cemeteries. These proposals were developed with an eye towards simplifying what had previously been an incredibly complex system of requirements for golf courses with a goal of updating application rates to reflect the best available science and a goal of doing so while achieving additional conservation, again, that reductions in withdrawals of groundwater in a realistic and equitable manner. Next slide, please. In addition to work group processes, the Ag BMP Advisory Committee was also reestablished and has met several times. That committee is actively working through a number of issues related to the Ag BMP program, but is on track to provide recommendations on that program by the early May deadline. Next slide, please. That early May deadline allows enough time for the recommendations from the BMP Advisory Committee uh, to be discussed alongside every, uh, several other issues in our 5MP subgroup while still allowing uh, enough time for ADWR staff to uh, draft the fifth management plans. Staff continue to work with stakeholders to flesh out the proposal for a brand new integrated farm program. And we'll discuss final details of that program along with the recommendations from the BMP committee in that May 19th meeting. Next slide. So back to this slide. We've talked already about the significant progress we've made, but there is still a lot to do. And there is additional process and opportunity for feedback ahead. It's worth noting here that we don't have the staff and the satellite offices that we once did, but we do have significant advantages in communication as compared to the earlier mid-90s, and we have made significant ex efforts to take advantage of the tools that we have available to us. We intend to continue updating the 5MP concepts page throughout the drafting process for the fifth management plans for each AMA, and have already begun to reach out to the GUACs for initial feedback on whether or how those concepts might need specific consideration for each AMA. We will also be moving much of the data that was previously printed in a static form in the plans to an online format. Not only does this allow that data to be interactive, filtered, or aggregated in new ways, but it also allows for corrections and updates to be made if errors are found and as additional years are added to the data. Next slide, please. 
We have already started the process for drafting the fifth management plans and will be drafting all five simultaneously over the course of this year. Like in previous plans, the structure will largely match across the AMAs, but we do want to hear from stakeholders in each AMA about the concepts that have been developed throughout the work group process. If there are adjustments that can be made to the details of a program for a specific AMA, now is the time to be considering those details, and we, we would really like to hear those types of suggestions from the regulated community and from our GUACs. We intend to move the work group and its subgroups into kind of a phase two. Rather than developing concepts, we'll re we will reconvene those groups um, on an as-needed basis to preview and provide feedback on draft regulatory language for each sector. This, again, is all working toward a goal of publishing initial draft plans in early 2022 adopting all five of those plans by the end of 2022, which ultimately allows those conservation programs and the fifth management plans to become effective on January 1st, 2025. Next slide, please. So back to this slide one last time and the final step in this timeline. Our goal is to publish the initial drafts of the fifth management plans early next year allow time for recommendations from the GUACs in each AMA, and to work through the legal adoption process for all five fifth management plans by the end of the year. Because there is a statutory timeline requiring that the plans be adopted at least two years before the requirements become effective, this timeline allows those conservation requirements to become effective on January 1st, 2025. So to circle back to the beginning and those two themes I mentioned at the beginning, First, we're on an aggressive timeline, but we are still working diligently to provide opportunity and space to have the needed conversations to develop the requirements for the fifth management plans. We have multiple methods for folks to engage, and there will be additional opportunity for feedback throughout the drafting process. Second, this process is different than in previous management plans, but also our world is different and our methods and opportunity for engagement are different. And this process has been uh, and can continue to be productive and functional. The fifth management plans will look different than previous plans and uh, this uh, process has been different than previous processes. This difference poses some challenges, but has also triggered innovation. With the concepts web page, surveys, individual meetings or discussions, and other tools. We've all adapted a lot for the last year, and we're very proud of the creative way that we and all the stakeholders in the regulated community have found to continue to have these difficult and production, productive discussions on these important issues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, I would really like to thank my team, our management plans team, for all of the work that has occurred behind the scenes to make all of this progress possible. Uh, they truly are kind of the behind the scene rock stars here. Um, I would also like to thank the stakeholders for the incredible amount of time that they have taken to attend meetings and to consider these issues. Um, and finally, thank you to you all for your time and attention today. So with that, uh, Director, I, I'd gladly take any questions. <clears throat> Thanks, Natalie. Before um, we take comments and questions, I want to highlight and say a few things. First, over the last six months or so, I've been in many of the meetings that have been held. I have seen a real commitment by the regulated community and our stakeholders to help us meet the short timeline to compromise with us. If you noticed on some of Natalie's slides for the programs, there were some strikethroughs for some of our proposed uh, action items or regulatory programs. And that really came about as a result of the back and forth 
between the stakeholders and the department. I also wanted to mention and highlight, uh, Natalie talked about the fact that when we have the regulatory language of the plans uh, written, we're going to reach out again to the stakeholders and to the GUACs. Uh, it's a little different than in the past when we waited until we had a draft of the entire plan. Uh, we wanted to really highlight this time around with, again, a short time frame and the virtual world that we live in, this regulatory language, because it's really the guts uh, of what most people are usually concerned with, not that the rest of the plans aren't important, but everyone is always focused on the regulatory requirements of the plans. So we hope that helps move the process forward and gives people more time to review the regulatory portions of the plan than we had in the fourth management plan process. And then I just wanted to say one, one last thing in terms of how the process between DWR and the stakeholders has been working and what kind of my direction to the staff has been. And I said this at the last Ag BNP committee meeting. I understand that some folks just by nature are more willing to speak in public. Um, some folks have more staff that they're more prepared than others. But my direction to the staff has been don't take silence as explicit agreement, but we're going to take silence as, quote, there is enough of a comfort level with what we're proposing to move that forward. So that's kind of how we're assessing uh, the comments we hear and maybe more importantly, the comments we don't hear. So with that, I'll open this up to questions and comments. And I saw Stephanie, uh, uh, Stephanie's name pop up when I first started talking. So perhaps, Stephanie, you can start us off. Thank you, Director. I might have some background noise. So can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. OK, thank you. Uh, more of just a, a comment, not really a question. Uh, obviously, given the tight timeline that, um, that Natalie has said, and to your comments to Director Buchatsky, um, we certainly appreciate from the ag community the time that's been taken, um, given those tight timelines to make sure that stakeholder input is adequate and that we're able to really dig into the details of what's been going on. I think that um, the acknowledgement by the director to, to our different groups between the ag subgroup, the best management practices advisory committee, and um, the subgroup, basically that, you know, a lot of institutional knowledge that existed in the department when these plans were created in earlier um, stages isn't uh, as much present anymore in the department. But uh, given that um, the department has allowed us to, to take the time to do field trips and do field visits and really dig into the weeds on the details of how some of these changes might affect our culture. And so I think that's really worked well with the different groups and it's really allowed us to work through, you know, issues. You know, we still have some, we obviously still have some work to do, but I just wanted to convey, um, to convey some appreciation to the department for, for uh, kind of slowing down the gear enough for us to have ample contribution to, to the process and really as far as the BMP advisory group to put in a concerted effort on those um, on those best management practices and really look at ways which we can improve them and things that are practical um, and that will be useful. So just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, I, I appreciate it. I know my staff really appreciates those comments. And again, we know there was some uneasiness or perhaps worse with the fourth management plan. Uh, in our quest for continuous improvement, something that's at the forefront of the Arizona management system that we deal with here in the department, we thought we made quite a few improvements in this fifth management plan process. And again, from what I've seen personally in terms of how those improvements have been accepted and uh, even more by the regulated community, I think we're on a great path. And one of the things we really strove to do in this process was to be able to build more relationships with folks in the regulated community. Something, Stephanie, I think you alluded to in losing that those relationships since the time of the third 
management plan process uh, and the institutional knowledge and folks that have walked out of the door here uh, over those over those years. Any other questions or comments from members of the council? Thank you, Director. I see that Bill Garfield may have a question or comment. Bill, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Bill Garfield. Uh, to show my consistency from some of my perspectives from the third management plan to the fifth management plan, uh, concerning loss and unaccounted for, I know the department and the corporation commission and others have uh, funded some of the uh, pilot studies on uh, the M36 manual and methods of leak detection and water loss control. And uh, even if that's not going to be, let's say, part of the base uh, BMP program, uh, is there going to be a consideration for that as a tool, perhaps, for those who are having difficulties achieve compliance with the 10% loss and unaccounted for standard? Uh, it, it would seem that that's a logical step, perhaps, but I just wanted to hear people's thoughts on that. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, so at this point, we are not looking at, um, I, I know there's been some discussion, some suggestion of potentially replacing the uh, lost and unaccounted for metric with some kind of an M36 style lost water type uh, metric. We're, we're not at this point pursuing that for the fifth management plans, but it is certainly something we've heard a lot of feedback on and something we would definitely be interested in pursuing further for future conservation programs. Um, that style of uh, water loss audit and, and accounting is included in the non per capita program, so there are BMP points available for, for that type of system, though. Thank you. I don't see any additional questions or comments in the chat box. Kennedy, what is this? Okay. So before we move on, one last chance for any members of the council to make comments or ask questions or make suggestions, a la Bill Garfield. And I'll pause just a second to make sure folks like you who have the same technical unmuting skills at me as me have a chance to unmute. Okay, hearing none, we'll move on then to the next altered agenda item, and that is discussion of the council's annual report uh, and Carol Ward will lead us through that discussion. Thank you, Director Bushatsky. Good morning, members of the council. If we could advance the slide, please. Thank you. It is difficult to believe that a year has passed and that we are already discussing the annual report again. As the chairman said, the executive order requires the council submit an annual report by July 1st of each year that describes the activities and recommendations of the council. ADWR staff will draft the document and submit it to the council for review and input. We expect to keep the format very similar to last year's report. The report will describe the council's purpose, its membership, and the role of the committees and the subcommittees. It will summarize the activities of the council and its committees over the course of the year. It will include meeting dates, agenda topics, and accomplishments. This section will also describe next steps anticipated by the council and committees for the next fiscal year. The final section will summarize the project proposals that were awarded funds from the $2 million appropriated in 2019 from the State General Fund for the purpose of providing support for groundwater conservation in the active management areas. When staff reported to the Council earlier this year, 
Melissa Sykes, the department's conservation grant coordinator, had just begun work on the contracts. I'm pleased to share with you today that she will soon complete the last of the contracts. Next slide, please. We have from now until the next council meeting to complete the drafting and review process. Today, I will be happy to take any input that you may have on the outline and content. You are also welcome to email me or John Riggins, the department's statewide planning manager, or to speak with us after the meeting. We will be drafting the report over the next several weeks. We plan to email the draft report to the council on May 3rd. We hope to provide two weeks from May 3rd through May 17 for council members to review and comment. This won't be a lengthy document, so it should be a manageable time frame for you. We will then incorporate the comments that we have received, editing the content as necessary. Once complete, ADWR's communications team will format the document. The formatted draft report should be emailed to the council on June 1st, allowing two weeks prior to, for the final review and feedback prior to the next council meeting on June 17th. At that point, we hope the report will be ready to deliver to the governor and legislators. And with that, Director, I would be pleased to take any questions or comment, comments. Um, <clears throat> Thanks, Carol. I just also want to point out that last year, I thought we successfully uh, navigated our way through the drafting, the, taking all your comments, and getting the annual report out on time. We were really in the middle of the throes of COVID at that point. And I'm sure most of you recall, we did not, we were not even able to have a June meeting of the council. This time we're planning on having that June meeting that Carol uh, pointed out will be coming. I'd particularly like to hear uh, from the council members if the schedule and process Carol laid out is going to work for you. Uh, you know your schedules way better, obviously, than we do. So now's the time to jump in, and we'll take comments, and you can unmute yourself as well. Thank you, Director. Tim Tamir has commented, schedule looks good to me. Sorry, who was that? Tim Tamur. Thanks, Tim. Warren Tenney has also commented, looks good to me. Thanks, Warren. No further questions or comments in the chat box at this time. So not hearing any additional uh, comments or questions. I thank all of you for your attention to this item. And this filing this annual report on time is a requirement under the executive order. We appreciate all of you uh, reviewing this when we send the draft to you. Uh, really look forward to having your input and having another really quality report as we've had in the past. So thank you, and with that, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which are a series of committee updates. The first committee update will be from the Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee, and Chairman Wade Noble will give us an update. Wade? Thank you. Can I be heard? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, we're hearing you. You Thank might you. speak a little bit more loudly if you can. I will. I hope that improves somewhat. Looking forward to it. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity, Director, for to have a presentation from the Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee. We have been working diligently and 
some of the results that we have produced, I think are going to be beneficial to the council and help others who might be participating in today's meeting. Okay, somewhere along in here is the slide. Our last meeting was on March 12th. Uh, at that time, we dealt with two principal topics, which were water importation and or augmentation and the storage sites that we have been coming to, in addition to those that were included in the previous Senate report. Uh, future long-term water augmentation committee meetings, I think we're going to be looking into uh, additional items for augmentation, pipe management, coastal management, as well as we're going to look into financing uh, the augmentation project for medium-sized and smaller entities. Next. Yeah. Okay. Chuck Cullum from CAWCD presented a really good report on water importation or augmentation for the Colorado River. Again, with a brief history of the Colorado River and the augmentation that has gone into it. That was significant to the extent that it provided us with a history and perspective of augmentation concepts on the Colorado River. It was as early as 1944 that the basin states understood that there was going to be a shortage or a deficit on the Colorado River. Some of us might recognize that that was about the time that we entered into the 1944 water treaty hearings. And it was obvious that if you gave 1.5 million acre feet to Mexico on top of an anticipated uh, 15 million acre feet, uh, pretty soon you were gonna run out of water. Uh, between 1964 and 1968, Basin State supported augmentation as a means to address future risk of shortages in the basin, and they include that in many of their concepts and studies. By 1975, a Westwide study had identified general augmentation concepts to address future shortages. 1993, the Bureau of Reclamation suppressed pilot study of snowpack augmentation began. And that's when we really started trying to understand how we could uh, modify weather or how Wait, sorry to interrupt, but there are some, I think, who are still having some trouble hearing you if you have any other way to increase the volume on your end. Okay, let me uh, see what I can do. I uh, tried to improve it. Has that helped? Is there a, is there an improvement? Uh, I think a little bit. Every little bit is helping. Let me try something else. If you have just a moment. Uh, okay. How did that help? Did that improve it at all? That's better. Okay, we'll use that microphone then. Okay, back to the history of uh, Colorado River augmentation and what we have done to try to improve it. Um, as late as 2020 um, and 2017, we started working binationally with uh, Mexico in order to try and improve uh, augmentation and specifically, we got into the study of desalination. The binational desalination study is developed mainly in the area of the Sea of Cortez, which many of us recognize as El Golfo. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Uh, extensive cooperative measures uh, and an adoption of a binational water scarcity contingency plan uh, came about in September of 2017. There was an expressed a clear need for continued and additional actions due to the impacts 
on Colorado River storage. Although most of the proposed projects are in Mexico, the opportunities that have been identified for augmentation through desalination uh, have the potential for a yield of approximately 200,000 acre feet a year. And the costs are uh, somewhere or estimated somewhere between $2,000 and $2,200 an acre foot. Uh, the uh, Opportunities that have been divide, uh, identified are both financially feasible and can be developed in an environmentally responsible manner. Besides desalination, uh, among the other things that have been studied quite carefully is the transbasin trans diversion augmentation concept. Um, Whatever that sounds like, it really just means let's get some water from somewhere else. Um, I know that we have, I think Representative Griffin is still on. I know that she's been working on this uh, issue uh, significantly during the session, but the, basically what we're looking at in the trans basin diversion augmentation is to move water from either the Missouri or Mississippi River uh, to offset existing Colorado River transportation diversions to the Front Range. And they started as early as 2008 uh, with a study for the Basin State's augmentation. In 2012, another Basin study came about through the Bureau of Reclamation, and it was also this concept of diversions was also on the 2014 short study list. The concept of transportation diversion that has been studied is that the transportation diversion remains in the Colorado River system. Uh, if we were able to use the concepts that have been developed, it could provide for an average transportation diversion of 500,000 acre feet a year. Uh, the costs are fairly significant. Um, the capital cost, it is estimated for the Missouri River transportation conversion or diversion would be about 5.6 billion. The annual and M cost would be about 155 million and the unit cost would be about $2,150 acre, $2,150 an acre foot. And of course, it's not something we can take care of tomorrow. Uh, we look at maybe 25 or 30 years to develop it. Um, as you look at the diagram there, I think it shows where we have um, a, shall we say, an outline of how we would get there. Next, let's go to our next slide. Great. In addition to looking at water augmentation in our past meeting, we had a report from our storage site subcommittee. You may remember that we formed the storage site subcommittee to identify criteria for selection of potential underground storage sites uh, for possible revision to the 2017 report, potential water storage sites on the Arizona State Land Department State Trust land. Now the, sub, the committee has met three times and ADR selected potential sites and evaluated the selected slide sites to identify if any common criteria surfaced. I've been personally really, I felt really good about what they've done. Um, next slide. Because they identified possibilities uh, that would relate uh, not just to the Phoenix, Scottsdale's, the Tucson's, but to uh, smaller areas that could benefit from uh, development of storage. The conclusion of this analysis showed that it is difficult to evaluate where it would be best to site projects on a statewide basis. Did not want to limit potential opportunities, and so they looked at everything, and local stakeholders are best prepared to evaluate potential sites opportunities. 
What would they need to consider to make an, an assessment and what resources are available to assist? That's the questions that each entity, each government level, whether it be city, state, town, county, um, what do they need to look at in order to be able to determine whether or not a storage site provides an opportunity for augmentation in the future uh, for them. Next slide. What we are proposing, and we not yet do not yet have the report, is uh, a guide to an underground water storage facility, a site selection. There would be a statewide evaluation criteria that would be applied to the various sites. The initial investigations for interested parties to consider include what the land use status is, what the technical feasibility is, the regulatory and permitting considerations, and facility conceptual development, as well as facility design. Next slide. Before we get to this conclusion, I want to add that one of the things that we got into was the possibility of discussing how to finance something, some of the things we've just discussed. Desalination uh, is a broad-based concept. Uh, it takes pretty good money. Uh, there have been larger cities that have used desalination in the United States. Uh, we have examples of many projects, say from Israel, of successful, successful desalination projects on a large scale. Financing those type of things requires perhaps a commitment from companies or entities that have the ability to do it in return for recovering their investments. On other situations such as storage sites, I think we're going to get into the possibility of looking at uh, the ability of a community, of a county, uh, or other governmental entities to put together a project that worked well. As the committee, the Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee discussed this situation, uh, there were several recommendations that we ought to be looking at making financing uh, ability available to those who might be interested. It's one thing to have a good idea for a project and as we all understand, it's quite another to find the money to get the project built. As a result of that discussion, we're going to start looking into on a committee basis uh, what it, what's available for financing these type of projects so that entities that might be interested can have some place to go. And as a result of that, we looked back at the GWAC the financing committee from the GWAC, and it just so happened that uh, on our current long-term water augmentation committee, the chair of the GWAC financing committee uh, was willing to cooperate and, and lead us in that. So a small group of our long-term water augmentation committee is going to look at updating the good work that was done by the GWAC financing committee. And with that, that's my report, Director. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to attempt to answer them or pass them over to John Riggins or Carol Ward. Thanks, Wade. A couple of things. I'm really impressed that you're willing to take on the finance issue once again. We know it was a challenge in the Governor's Water Augmentation Council, the GWAC, that preceded this council. We know there was a committee for that purpose under the Water Resources Development Commission that was stood up in 2010. I recall some earlier discussions in the mid-2000s, also led by Director Gunther. Uh, they've always been very challenging, so uh, I wish you good luck with that uh, phase, the finance phase of your committee now. I also wanted to make a couple of comments about the desalination discussions with Mexico that you alluded to. There was a report filed last June with the International Boundary and Water Commission uh, on the U.S. side, CELA as it's known on the Mexico side. You can find that report on that website. Um, in terms of the cost that you alluded to for the Missouri River, 
my recollection for what we're potentially looking at for Sea of Cortez desal water delivered up in the Yuma area for potential exchange for Mexico's Colorado River water is in the neighborhood of $2,200 to $2,500 per acre foot. Uh, we are looking at doing the next phase of the Sea of Cortez study. I think we, we on the U.S. side uh, have funding partners lined up to help fund that next phase. Unfortunately, with the uh, change in the federal administration and with a lot of changes last summer in Mexico, in the organizations that participate in the implementation of Minute 323, uh, we've had some real challenges in standing up that next phase and moving that forward. We do have what's called a Minute Oversight Group meeting uh, with uh, Mexico and the U.S. in April. Hope to hear more then about moving all of the committee, all of the work groups forward, including the DSAL work group. And I am still the uh, United States section uh, co-chair of that Minute 323 DSAL work group. So uh, I am down in the weeds. So I'm very hands-on and. Uh, have a great opportunity to help move that forward on behalf of Arizona and all the other potential partners that we might put together for that Sea of Cortez desal. So with that, happy to answer any questions about that. Happy to tee up an opportunity to ask questions or make comments for Wade. So members of the council, if you have any comments, questions, et cetera, now's the time. I see in the chat box here that Ellie has a comment. She's commented that storage site augment water for total system or just divert from Colorado River that is already oversubscribed. If I may, Director. I had trouble hearing the comment. Can you repeat that again louder? Sure. Ellie has commented in the chat box, does storage site augment water for total systems or just divert from Colorado River that is already oversubscribed? Thank you, if I may, Director. Uh, Ellie, the uh, storage site study is different from the Colorado River work. Uh, the augmentation report was on the Colorado River, but the storage sites deal with non-Colorado River uh, mainly to the east of the river throughout the rest of Arizona. So it was not intended to store Colorado River water. And Wade, I'll, I'll also add that there, there is, and it's largely defunct, I think, a seven basin state augmentation committee. Uh, I am the co-chair of that committee along with uh, the gentleman from Wyoming in that committee and during those discussions with the basin states, we have often discussed how augmentation might be used in the future and whether that augmentation it would be for the increasing the sustainability and reliability of the river or for uh, going towards new growth. And that is a debate we've had, we will continue to have, and maybe there will be uh, some of each. Uh, it's easier to find the money uh, when someone's willing to pay for that water for growth than it might be to find the money to make the river more sustainable. But it is certainly on our radar screen that that is an issue, and we've had those discussions uh, at least for the last ten, 10 years that I've been involved in Colorado River here at the department. Are there other comments? If not, Director, if I may, since we're dropping names of past friends, I did not intentionally neglect to mention the fact that uh, leading our group uh, in determining how to update the financing recommendations from the GWAC Financing Committee will be one Sandy Favorites, uh, 
It might be unknown to the department, but hopefully she'll be able to stand in good for her understanding of uh, what it takes to finance these things. When I talk about Sandy, I like to say that's another fine mess you've gotten me into. <laughs> and my it's recollection is Sandy was also the <laughs> <laughs> Sandy was also the WRDC committee person, if I remember correctly. Sandy, isn't that right? I was there, yeah. <laughs> yes, you were. So thanks, we, mess, thanks everyone. I have Any other comments confident. or questions? All right, we will move on to the next committee update, and that is from the non-AMA Groundwater Committee, chaired by Representative Griffin and Jamie Kelly. And I'm not sure who's going to start. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Either. Are you, Are you hearing, hearing that hearing feedback? feedback? Yeah, we're getting huge feedback. Uh, hopefully everyone who is not speaking can turn off their microphones. Can you hear now? We're still getting uh, a lot of feedback, Representative Griffin. I don't know if you have both the computer on and your phone perhaps. I do not. If you do, maybe if you turn off one or the other, that probably will solve the issue. Can you hear me now? I don't I have don't my phone on. Phone. You're Good still night. channeling your inner, inner Jimi Hendrix. Lots of feedback. Good morning, Director. Am I providing the same type of feedback? No. 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 Jamie, no, yours no, is no. loud and clear with no echoes. Then, with Gail's, with Representative Griffin's consent, I'll give a brief update of the last meeting. Go ahead. The Sorry, Nadia's Representative Griffin. I think the staff just said it looks like you might be logged in to the webinar twice. You, you might just log completely off and log completely back in. Again, that's about the level of my technical expertise when I have these issues. Reboot. So we'll, we'll give Representative Griffin a chance to log out and log back in for a minute. And from our end, we can probably see that when she has logged back in. While, while we're waiting, I just heard that we missed a comment on the annual report from Bass. Bass, do you want to unmute while we're dealing with these technical issues and let us know what your comment is? Yes. Uh, Tom, I, I just would comment, and I will through the comment period. Um, uh, you know, I'll put um, uh, more meat on the bones related to this, but. I had a comment about, you know, we use the word in the report, it just says, you know, one of the six issues, whatever, exempt wells. But then when you go into the report, the, the real evidence or facts related to that are, are all of, mainly about Prescott AMA. So I, I just wonder if, if we don't use a little better title for that rather than exempt wells, and maybe it's exempt wells in. AMAs or exempt wells in Prescott because 
that that's where all the evidence and then the subsequent discussion about that is surrounding that issue and that that was my point but we'll, we'll provide that in comments when in, during the re, uh, commenting period for the report thanks Bass, and I, I will hold that comment and I think that comment is uh, pointed at the report that's put together by the post 2025 AMA committee uh, and we haven't gotten to that agenda item yet but uh, we'll keep that in our pocket for that discussion as well. Do we have Representative Griffin back yet? So perhaps, Jamie, you can start, and when, when and if we get Representative Griffin back, um, she can add to your comments, if that works. Certainly it works. The non-AMA Groundwater Committee met last December. It received two presentations, one from Chief Counsel at DWR, Mr. Ken Selinski on INAs, and one from Representative Cobb on Rural Management Authority. Um, there, there were some discussions on both types of authority. No consensus was reached at the committee level. However, there was a robust discussion on what the type of authority should look like if there is an authority. Um, there were some positive comments on Representative Cobb's proposed legislation. There were, of course, concerns articulated against it. The concerns with IMA, INAs remain that the, the director is allowed only to look at historical data and not to take into account prospective uses. And that is, there is an issue brief that will be circulated in the near future summarizing the discussion from that December meeting. Thanks, Jamie. And one thing I would ask as you consider the issue briefs, if, if there are issues that really have connections to each other and address multiple stakeholder groups, We'd like to see the issue paper kind of be a collective paper rather than um, having the issues portrayed back to the council separately, because I think that will help the understanding, uh, will help us to see how everything fits together. Uh, and I understand now that Representative Griffin, you're back with us. I am back with you. And, and you're loud happy. and clear. Okay, good. I don't know what I missed. Uh, I will get with with Jamie and and work on the next uh, list of presentations. Uh, we had a presentation from Representative Cobb. I don't know that we took on the the subject. There was no consensus on the agreement on the issues. Um, the uh, the comments from Wade Noble was was uh, excellent on uh, what we can do to save water uh, raining uh, when it rains we lose most of the water i'm told by several hydrologists that we're we're losing 95 percent of the rains we get through evaporation and hard surface roads so if if we can improve on uh, stormwater runoff and collect some of that water and have storage macro water harvesting projects uh, like what Cochise County is doing uh, throughout the state, I think it's a great benefit the, uh, and, a, and a great opportunity. Um, I'm not sure, Jamie, what all you, you covered. Uh, we do have some legislation going, going through, and maybe uh, in the next month we can compile all the things that actually go through. Uh, we have one more week of committee meetings, so if it doesn't get committee meetings, nothing is dead until we sign and die. Uh, so we'll continue working on that. But we do have some good water projects, uh, water legislation that has passed, and and we look forward to more. Uh, that uh, I think we have a couple of those bills sitting on the governor's desk, and hope hope to get more uh, for consideration. Um, the director's comments about being quiet doesn't necessarily mean an agreement. And so I think 
more people are going to speak up. Um, the concern, of course, is rural Arizona and non-active management areas and what we're doing. And, and in many cases, we're doing more than um, in some of the active management areas. So we need to make a list and let everybody know all the things that we are doing. Uh, one of the concerns I understand when I talk to uh, Representative Cobb was their concern for agriculture water having an impact on future industrial park needs. And so I did uh, assure her that during the interim, I'd come out to her district and we we chat more and move forward to see what we can do to uh, to address some of those issues. So I look forward to doing that. I think that's probably other than best management practices and what the ag community is doing. I'm really impressed. And my door is always open. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Representative Griffin. So your co-chair did talk about some of the same issues and did mention Representative Cobb's presentation and that there was not consensus uh, among the group uh, listening to that presentation. I also wanted to note about the macro water harvesting, um, to use that term. I believe in 2014, the legislature created a legislative committee. I know that then DWR director, I think, was appointed to that committee, but my recollection is they never met. Um, I think macro rainwater harvesting should be on the table. I know that there are lots of concerns over legal issues, water rights, those kind of things, but I would really ask people to roll up their sleeves again on that issue and see if we can find a path forward. If we can enhance recharge, it is going to benefit so many of us, so much of rural Arizona, but also uh, the flows in the rivers that supply so much of non-rural Arizona of metropolitan Arizona. So there's a lot of potential benefit for the state as a whole. I know there are some scary legal issues potentially over the water rights, but if we don't maybe get back to talking about that, I know that we won't end up in a place where we might be able to make some of it happen. So I'm glad to hear that that's on your radar screen. Thank you, and, and I, I agree if we're losing it to evaporation, and we're only saving 5% of the rains that we get, let's try to double that 5% to a, to 10%. And let's set some goals. Uh, it's, if it evaporates, it's, you know, we don't have it. So it, it is a good project to work on. And again, this, this council and the committees you stood up, I think are expressly designed so that we can have some hard conversations about issues and look to improve our water future for our state. So it's the perfect forum. And hopefully you all in your committee can tee up that issue moving forward. I look forward to it. Thank you. Any quest other questions, comments for either Jamie or Representative Griffin? By committee members. Hearing none, we will move on to the next committee update, and that is the DSAL Nation Committee. And I think a relatively new chairman, Henry Day, and a relatively new member to this council. Welcome, Henry, and good to uh, be working with you closely again as we did back in our former lives for the city of Phoenix. So, Henry. The floor is yours. Thank you, Director Vyshovsky. Good morning, uh, members of the council. My name is Henry Day, and I represent APS on water policy and strategy issues. Uh, I'm reporting on the activities of the desalination committee under former chair Philip Richards. Although the January committee meeting was canceled, 
the regulatory and legal issues subcommittee under Scott Miller has been active. This subcommittee developed a draft legal regulatory issues summary, and it has been sent to the subcommittee members for comment and will be discussed at the next desalination committee meeting. That is scheduled for March 5th at 10 a.m. Following that meeting, a status report will be presented to the council at its June meeting. And thank you. That concludes my report. Thanks, Henry. Any comments or questions from council members for Henry? Hearing none, we will move on to the last committee update. And last, but certainly in no way, shape, or form least, the post-2025 AMA committee. Co-chairs Warren Tenney and Tim Tomier, I think, are both going to tag team on the report. So I think, Tim, are you up first? Uh, thank you, Director Bershowski. Yes, I'll be starting off first. So um, I will uh, have the honor of introducing this topic, and then Warren and I will go back and forth as we go through our presentation. So to begin, uh, for over a year now, as co-chairs of the post-2025 AMA's committee, Warren Tenney and I have been presenting to the council status updates on the progress of the committee. Today, we, we are pleased to report that the post-2025 AMA's committee has finished the first stage of work, and we are ready to roll up our sleeves and get to work on the second phase. To help us get to this point, we want to thank all of the committee participants for their consistent participation and patience over the past year Plus, we appreciate ADWR staff who have provided much assistance to the co-chairs and the committee. On a personal note, I would like to take this opportunity to announce that I will be stepping down as co-chair of the committee at the conclusion of this meeting. As many of you know, I have accepted a new assignment as interim assistant city manager with the city of Tucson. While Tucson water and water issues are still under my purview, I am no longer able to give this committee the level of attention and effort it deserves as a co-chair. I will remain fully engaged as a member of the Governor's Water Council, along with my other duties, including the Arizona Reconsultation Committee. I appreciate having had the opportunity to work so closely with Warren, ADWR, CWCD, and all of the committee members in reaching today's critical milestone. And as you will see from our presentation, we have made significant progress in identifying future challenges and opportunities within the AMAs, and I'm excited about the committee's work ahead to develop new strategies and solutions. I did notify Director Bushkotsky of this decision to step down, and I would uh, turn it back to Tom at, at the appropriate moment to discuss uh, leadership of the committee moving forward. So, Tim, thank you. I want to thank you on behalf of all the council and DWR for all the work you've done. I think we will best go through all of the uh, report outs on uh, this committee's work. And I also uh, will need to talk about a letter I received uh, this morning regarding this committee. At the end of that process, perhaps we'll talk here with the council about uh, moving forward, appointing another co-chair, unless Warren's going to tell me he's resigning too, which I'm not aware that that's about to happen. And I see him smiling, and he knows I'm just giving him a hard time. So, Warren, I think Tim has turned it over to you to continue with the report. Thanks. Yes, I'll continue to be masochistic and continue as co-chair. Uh, next slide, please. So the post-2025 AMA's committee was charged with identifying opportunities or challenges to groundwater management within the active management areas, and then coming up with strategies and solutions to address those challenges beyond 2025. So why 2025? Well, 2025 is the milestone that the framers of the Groundwater Management Act gave us because they knew that the work to manage our water resources is never done. 
The Groundwater Management Act was put in place to conserve, protect, and allocate the use of groundwater resources of the state in order to protect and stabilize the general economy and overall welfare of the state and its citizens. And that remains our responsibility today to continue to protect and stabilize the general economy and overall welfare of the state and its citizens by learning from the last 40 years and to determine how we build on the framework given us. The Groundwater Management Act gave the time frame of 1980 to 2025. The act and its provisions remain in place after 2025 but the statutes do not specify how we are to improve water management in the AMAs after that year. The leaders in 1980 left that to us to decide. They certainly did not expect everything would be perfect by 2025 when it came to water management in the AMAs. So we cannot rest on our laurels or assume the status quo is sufficient for the future but rather we need to take full advantage of this upcoming milestone to set an equally successfully successful trajectory for at least the next 40 years. And that is what we have started to do in this committee. Next slide. The task given to the post 2025 AMAs committee by the council to identify opportunities and challenges facing the AMAs and then develop strategies and solutions to address those challenges is consistent with what Arizona has always done. We are not afraid to look at the water issues facing us and finding ways to improve. We are benefiting today from the Groundwater Management Act and the framework it gave us for the Assured Water Supply Rules and other water management tools. We have made progress in reducing groundwater over overdraft, and we are in a better situation than we were in 1980, all while experiencing great economic growth. Yet challenges remain. The AMAs have not yet met their goals. Overdraft of groundwater continues. Renewable supplies are increasingly difficult to acquire. And imbalance between available water supplies and demand remains that will inevitably drive additional groundwater declines, particularly as pressures on the state's other water supplies increase due to shortages, drought, and growing demand. Arizona's water management successes over the last 40 years are due to the willingness of its stakeholders to face challenges, have difficult discussions, and develop strategies and policies to ensure its water future. The post-2025 AMAs committee seeks to continue that legacy, building upon the existing framework and successful programs in order to strengthen water management and maintain the quality of life and the thriving economy that residents in the AMAs enjoy well beyond 2025. The Governor's Water Council gives us the responsibility to work to ensure that decades after 2025, we will once again look back in appreciation of our state's ongoing stewardship of its water resources. Next slide. Despite the COVID, let's see, I'm sorry, our overall approach as a committee is to identify opportunities or challenges in the AMAs and to then identify potential strategies and solutions. To accomplish the objective, we decided not to rush to develop strategies or solutions, but rather to first agree on several challenges the AMAs are facing and develop a common understanding about those issues. As co-chairs, we felt that we would be in a better position to succeed by first acknowledging the opportunities and issues we want to address. We know this frustrated some committee members who were eager to take a deep dive or more directly suggest solutions, but we believe the committee will be more productive now that we have a collective foundational understanding about the long-term issues we want to work on. Next slide. So on progress to date, despite the COVID situation, we continue to meet virtually. The committee has met nine times since its inception a year and a half ago. The committee meetings have drawn well over 100 attendees. 
We engage through the virtual meetings and have been continually open to feedback through that forum as well as through written comments on draft papers and the use of surveys. We found through both the virtual discussions and written comments, we have had good engagement from stakeholders that has increased our understanding of each other's perspectives and provided an overall understanding about the six issues we eventually identified and documented. We will provide you more detailed information today on those six issues, which represent a spectrum of water management opportunities. They are not necessarily new. We have been discussing these challenges for decades due to their complexity. In fact, we know many of them were discussed back around 1999 and 2000 during another governor's water initiative. What is unique now is that we have an additional 20 years of experience and we are looking at these issues in 2021 with the focus on how we can approve water management past 2025. Just as our predecessors did 40 years ago, we are motivated to make improvements and seize opportunities today for the betterment of the future. Hopefully this council and the committee's effort to identify these issues will be recognized as Arizona being willing to grapple with and not ignore these difficult subjects in order to improve overall water management in the AMAs. By documenting these issues, the committee is providing a foundational understanding about water management in the AMAs as 2025 approaches, a foundation from which the committee can begin to, de to develop potential solutions or strategies to address these interrelated challenges. Next slide. So the six areas of opportunity to improve upon water management in the AMAs are categorized as the hydrologic disconnect, exempt wells, unreplenished groundwater withdrawals, groundwater in the assured water supply program, water supplies for replenishment by the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District, and the post-2025 AMA's management structure. For each of these challenges, the committee drafted a paper to explain the issue in a succinct, objective, and straightforward way so that you and anyone interested will understand the challenge and why we should work to find a strategy or solution to address it. Each paper includes an issue statement and then the description of the issue. We intentionally called each paper an issue brief because we wanted it to be a brief, objective overview that gave factual background and description about the issue. Each brief was reviewed by ADWR and other pertinent stakeholders such as CAWCD in regard to the CAGRD brief to ensure they are technically sound and factual. There may not have been perfect agreement on how certain points were developed within the briefs or on whether too much or not enough information was given or on the best tone used to describe an issue. But as the co-chairs, we had to continually balance the various perspectives and viewpoints expressed by the committee so that the briefs captured all sides of an issue and avoid presupposing solutions. Overall, we want to emphasize we had a we have we had we have agreement on each issue statement and that there was concurrence at the last committee meeting that the issues should be presented to the governor's water council so that the committee can progress to its next stage. In its next stage, the committee will begin to identify and develop the strategies that might help us to address these issues. Before reviewing each of the issues with you in more detail, it is important to emphasize that while we develop six individual briefs, the committee recognizes that they are highly interconnected which is why we are presenting them to you as one package. They need to be considered together, and this will remain particularly important when looking at any potential strategies and solutions, which could very well cover several of the topics. So at this point, we'd like to walk you through the six issues. Next slide. 
The first issue deals with hydrologic disconnect. This is when recharge can happen in one part of the AMA and recovery can take place in another part. This also applies to groundwater pumping occurring in one part of the AMA and replenishment by the CAGRD can be done somewhere else. This practice is legally permitted under statute because we currently looking at we currently look at managing the AMA as a whole. Yet, this hydrologic disconnect is a more localized basis has long been recognized as having the potential to create to create or worsen localized groundwater depletion, especially in the future during shortages when cities and others begin to recover long term storage credits from areas different than when where the water was stored. And also, as the CAGRD continues to accrue an obligation to replenish groundwater. That was pumped by its members in disparate areas of the three AM uh, of the three AMAs that it serves. While more work needs to be done to understand the scale of the identified issue today, there is little question that a large or persistent disconnect between recharge and recovery, or between pumping and replenishment, could lead to localized aquifer hotspots in the long term. We are happy to pause here and see if there are any questions about this first issue of the six. So, Tim, let me jump in real quick. I think as you and Warren made the point that these issues are all connected and that many of the stakeholders, uh, most of the stakeholders uh, who have a stake in one issue also have a stake in another issue, it might be best to wait until uh, we do all of the issue briefs from you two before we ask questions kind of to reinforce the interconnected nature of the stakeholders and of the issues. So I'll ask you to proceed with the rest of the issues first before we do the questions and comments. Okay, thank you, Chair Bershotsky. So we can go to the next slide and, and back to Warren. So for the second issue, exempt wells, we focus primarily on exempt wells in the Prescott AMA. Data from ADWR show that the quantity and capacity of exempt wells in the Prescott AMA have the potential to contribute to groundwater overdraft there more so than any other AMA. The brief details that the pumping from exempt wells represent approximately 11% of the total water demand in the AMA. In comparison, exempt wells in the Phoenix AMA are estimated at less than 1% of only municipal water use. ADWR calculates that the potential pumping capacity of the exempt wells in the Prescott AMA could total over 150,000 acre feet per year. Even if we assumed only a quarter of that capacity was utilized, it would almost double the current water usage in the Prescott AMA. All this leads to various concerns about the impacts to groundwater from the proliferation of exempt wells. This points to issues with exempt wells, but also with the overall management approach in the Prescott AMA and its ability to meet its management goal. Next slide. The third issue is unreplenished groundwater withdrawals. Unreplenished groundwater pumping refers to groundwater that is legally withdrawn without the requirement or obligation to artificially, artificially replenish or replace the volume of water pumped. In the issue brief, we summarize the different kinds of groundwater pumping that are legally allowed in the agricultural, industrial, and municipal sectors. The issue brief breaks out the average annual unreplenished groundwater demand between 2012 through 2016 within each AMA and attributed to the different sectors. For example, in the Phoenix AMA, there was an average of over 900,000 acre feet annually of groundwater demand without a replenishment requirement. It is a challenge to address this residual pumping since for the past 40 years, each water use sector has become accustomed to utilizing various types of allowable groundwater. Yet the committee deemed it important to shed light on the different sources of unreplenished withdrawals, to what extent this pumping is taking place in the AMAs, 
and what the impact of that pumping may be. By being fully aware of and understanding this issue, we can develop strategies or incentives to reduce those withdrawals or otherwise mitigate the impacts of unreplenished pumping, which will only become more critical with each passing year. Next slide. So the fourth issue is groundwater in the Assured Water Supply Program. The Assured Water Supply Program has been a significant factor in encouraging municipal water providers to reduce groundwater use in the AMAs over the last 25 years. The 100-year assurance of a water supply has also provided rationale and security for significant economic development in the AMAs. Within the context of the pr three previous issues, the committee determined we should look at the Assured Water Supply Program to consider how it could better provide consumer and economic protection and better aid in, in achieving the AMA management goals. The committee recognized that under the current regulatory structure, both replenished and unreplenished groundwater can be used to serve subdivisions that fall under the jurisdiction of the Assured Water Supply Program. This will become more challenging as groundwater withdrawals by all sectors impact the ability of new Assured Water Supply applicants to demonstrate physical availability of groundwater. We have seen challenges in this regard in the Prescott AMA and most recently in the Pinal AMA. The other AMAs are likely to face reduced physical availability of groundwater sometime after 2025, which can curtail the ability to subdivide lands for new development, but also continued reliance on groundwater may lead to other adverse impacts as depths to groundwater decline. We also acknowledged that groundwater dependent municipal water providers face obstacles in their ability to acquire renewable water supplies to become designated, to extend their existing designations or to reduce or eliminate their reliance on groundwater. A key challenge is with fewer renewable supplies available for acquisition, competition for those supplies will only increase in the future. Yet even if renewable supplies are plentiful, we cited additional obstacles that water providers could still face in obtaining and then putting to use new supplies. The overarching challenge is how do water providers finance these renewable water supplies, particularly those providers with smaller customer bases or with large geographical distance, distance from augmentation opportunities. And in the long run, well beyond 2025, we need to always recognize that no matter the status of a provider's assured water supplier, supply, homeowners will continue to rely on the water provider for service with an expectation of consumer protection by local or state government. Next slide. The fifth, the fifth issue focuses on CAGRD replenishment and water supplies. The co-chairs and the committee recognized this as a difficult topic to discuss and worked to be objective and to understand differing perspectives. I believed we learned a great deal and advanced the conversation. CAGRG provides a mechanism to demonstrate consistency with the management goal. CAWCD is responsible for the CAGRD and administrative very well. Through the years, CAWCD and stakeholders have pursued measures to benefit the CAGRD and reduce uncertainties about the CAGRD's ability to secure renewable supplies to offset its growing replenishment obligations. There is no near-term concern that it won't be able to meet its obligations. However, similar to water providers, CAGRD continues to face uncertainties related to the availability and costs of supplies for replenishment. Yet unlike water providers, CEGRD has a unique 
statutory responsibility requiring it to secure supplies for replenishment. The committee felt it was important to explore these uncertainties as they pertain to water supplies for CAGRD's replenishment obligations and to understand the surrounding concerns. So moving forward, we might find opportunities to mitigate those uncertainties and ensure the long-term viability of the CAGRD. We discussed the expectation of increased competition for limited supplies, rising acquisition costs, increased growth using groundwater supplies requiring replenishment, and the growing risk of Colorado River shortages and how those challenges may impact the CAGRD's distinctive responsibility to secure water supplies to replenish excess groundwater used by its growing membership. Next slide. The sixth and last issue is regarding the management structure of the AMAs. As noted earlier, the statutes discuss the Groundwater Management Act through 2025. Per the Act, the Director of ADWR is required by statute to develop a management plan for each AMA for each of the five management periods which span the years 1980 through 2025. The management plans are designed to assist each AMA in achieving its management goal. The fifth and final management period is statutorily defined to cover 2020 to 2025. The management plans that will be developed for this fifth and final period will remain effective thereafter until the legislature determines otherwise. There are no statutory provisions for defined management periods beyond 2025 nor for ADWR to produce additional AMA management plans. This leaves the state with, the li with limited ability to adapt, build upon, revise groundwater management plans and strategies in the AMAs as needed due to projected population growth, ongoing drought, a drier, warmer climate, and anticipated Colorado River shortages, among other factors. In order to provide certainty and more effectively plan and manage water supplies in the AMAs in the future, this issue describes that it is critical to clarify whether the AMA management goals, the 10-year management period cycle, and the management plans themselves are appropriate and should be carried forward after 2025. Next slide. With the milestone of 2025 only four years away, we believe that the committee understands that facing these challenges and not shying away from difficult discussions will help ensure the quality of life and thriving economy that benefit all of us well beyond 2025. As co-chairs, we believe that that is what was envisioned by the framers of the 1980 Groundwater Management Act and also envisioned when the governor pulled us together as a water council. We regulate and manage our water resources because of water's importance to every facet of our lives and to further ensure our children and grandchildren have plenty of water as well. We're glad that the governor and his water council recognize that while we have come a long way since 1980, we must be willing to take an honest look at the issues that face water management in the AMAs today, not ignore them, but show that Arizona is continually taking action to strengthen and improve the management of, water, of our water resources far beyond 2025. Next slide. And so we believe this first stage of the committee's work has helped to increase our collective understanding about the opportunities and issues for improving water management in the AMAs. As co-chairs, we, we certainly have learned much from everyone's participation on the committee and have gained a better appreciation for the various perspectives regarding the issues facing the. So today, the post 2025 AMA's committee is seeking support from the council that these interconnected challenges facing the AMA's should be advanced to the committee's next phase. The committee will then delve into developing strategies and solutions to ensure that water management in the AMA's continues to meet the state's objectives far beyond 2025. 
As co-chairs, we believe that strategies and solutions need to be developed and assessed in relationship to the immediate and long-term needs and consequences of the challenges presented. We are confident that we can develop strategies and solutions by continuing an honest, objective, and open conversation among the committee members as well as with the council. Thank you, and with that, we'll be glad to turn this back over to, to Director Bushatsky. Thanks, Warren and Tim, and we will have questions and comments, but first, uh, I, so that we have the opportunity to holistically discuss and ask questions. I mentioned earlier that I received a letter uh, today submitted by Arizona Rock Products Association, EPCOR, Water, Global Water, Home Builders Association of Central Arizona, Southern Arizona Home Builders Association, Valley Partnership, and Water Utilities Association of Arizona. So uh, there's an attachment to the letter as well with kind of a subheading that says stakeholder reply brief. I'm not going to try to characterize the letter or discuss what's in it. I'm going to ask any one of the members of the council that is part of one of the groups that sent this letter to me to have an opportunity, to give you an opportunity to uh, describe for the council members uh, what your letter says and some of the concerns raised in it. So I don't know if there's somebody who wants to start from that stakeholder group, but I'll throw it over to you. Tom, it's Spencer. Can you hear me? Hi, Spencer. Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, but go ahead. Okay. I, I, for the, the coalition, and we wanted to um, thank uh, Warren and Tim, the co-chairs of this process. It's obviously been a healthy discussion and um, in a very uh, important discussion, as, as they highlighted earlier in their presentation. Um, Arizona has a rich and thoughtful history of regulating um, our water supplies and the manner to protect consumers, and these conversations are a continuation of that. We welcomed the conversations and uh, had, a, had, had a robust opportunity to engage in the co-chairs in both comments and meetings to work through these difficult issues, so we, we value that and appreciate the discussion, but at the end of the day, there still remains some significant differences. Um, those are outlined in the letter. Um, I'll just touch on a couple quickly that um, we, we think it's kind of premature at this point to move forward um, after I these problems without greater research and evaluation to the level that these problems exist and would rather do more significant um, research on these problems prior to this moving forward. Um, and sec uh, the, t the tone, uh, specifically the GRD paper, is problematic. Um, it seems to identify the GRD as a problem where the coalition views the GRD as a solution. Uh, which is to acquire renewable supplies to support growth going forward. That's the purpose of why it exists. And, you know, and having, having said that, we would, um, if these papers do move forward, uh, we would uh, like to request that our comments and letter are included in the report demonstrating our concern um, and kind of the, the, the other side and how we look at these issues um, as, the, as these reports go forward. So I, I would appreciate your consideration of that. Thanks, Spencer. Anyone else from the Stakeholder Coalition want to speak before I say a few things? I do see that Ted Cook would like to provide comments. Ted, you have the floor. You're not from the coalition, but we'll take your. Why don't we wait, Ted, until um, we have the more general discussion? I was asking at this point just for the coalition folks, and I haven't seen any, so I'll say this to Spencer's last request. Um, unless I hear 
otherwise from any of the council members now, DWR is going to take uh, the letter and uh, the attachment to the letter and compend it together with the report from the committee, the five issues all rolled up into one report as they have done, so that we have a holistic uh, accounting of both the report out from the committee and the stakeholder reply brief and issues raised therein by the stakeholder group that I mentioned. So we will do that. We will post that all together online as one document, so to speak. We will send council members a link to that document, which is how we've been communicating with all of you, especially when there are you know, relatively lengthy papers <laughs> that attach to those links. So we will move forward with that. Um, we will also, again, after our discussion and question uh, period coming up here, get back to replacing uh, the irreplaceable Tim Tom, as co-chair of the committee. So, Ted, since you raised your hand first in terms of comments and questions in general, uh, I'll ask you, Ted, to unmute and address the council. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow council members and other folks who are attending this morning's meeting. And I really appreciate the presentation this morning by uh, Tim and Warren as it addressed many of the points that I was going to make, so I will be as succinct as possible. I do want to acknowledge the committee and the co-chairs for hard work on these difficult and challenging issues. The six issues identified in the issue papers broadly impact groundwater users across Arizona both in the CAGRD and, and non-CAGRD entities, and they are interrelated. And any strategies and solutions need to be developed with this interrelation uh, in, in mind. I was very happy to hear the acknowledgement of this interdependency um, from the co-chair's presentation this morning. I've heard broad support for this concept, that there needs to be comprehensive discussions that encompass the entirety of the problems and the solutions not just focused on small areas, like for instance, CAGRD, and I'll, I'll get into why here in just, just a minute. CAGRD, for instance, is a small part of the overall perceived problem and is, after all, actually replenishing groundwater. Uh, I do want to specifically thank the co-chairs for working closely with us at CWCD and CAGRD and soliciting our feedback, along with ADWR and staff, um, while the issue briefs uh, were being uh, related, particularly to the AWS program and CAGRD were being developed. As the committee chairs mentioned, early discussions on the issue papers concentrated mostly on solutions rather than identifying problems and consequences, focusing only on evidence that supported these conclusions. And this is a common pitfall of problem solving is, is going right to what we ought to do, what, which really needs to come at the end, not the beginning of the process. So there still is somewhat of a solution-oriented tone in, in the issue briefs, particularly uh, shared water supply and CAGRD, but the co-chair's efforts and the committee discussions have led to a far more balanced perspective. That being said, uh, CWCD is aware um, that there are still concerns from a number of stakeholders on the overall tone of the issue briefs and where we are going next. CAGRD, as you all know, has successfully transitioned away from excess water over the last few years. It's not available anymore and uh, is prepared with supplies in hand to meet the projected replenishment obligation through 2050. And so I would like again to, to thank the co-chairs for pointing that out that there is not an immediate um, concern with inability of CGRD to meet its statutory obligations. And throughout the three decades between now and 2050, CAGRD and its members will continue to work to develop and finance additional supplies. That is a challenge, but it's, we're not gonna stop now. There is a robust governance, regulatory and planning process in place. Every 10 years per statute, CAGRD must submit a plan of operation to ADWR. The planning process is an important component to address long-term issues well before they arrive. This is something that goes on continuously um, uh, to, to uh, Im improve the situation on a daily basis. People are working on this every day. CWCD acknowledges the importance of forward thinking and planning on the part of the committee. We 
have a reputation in Arizona as doing this very well. Uh, however, as I said before, I want to caution the committee and the council from identifying solutions in search of a problem or in advance of a real issue. Those type of solutions do not reach consensus and we need to have consensus. Specifically, I do not want the council to be lulled into a false satisfaction of having done something by implementing a few short-sighted and largely unneeded solutions, specifically on CAGRD, without really making a dent in the larger issues and then saying, okay, we did something really important here and, and we don't go any further. That would be very disappointing. So again, any solution must be, it must be based on data and facts and built around consensus before being implemented. I'm in support of the discussions continuing and the process moving on to the next step, but we don't need to rush into seemingly expedient solutions that really may be insignificant and unnecessary in the near term that focus only on a small subset of the water community and the overall problem. Finally, I need to recognize, of course, that the CWC board and the CAGRD subcommittee will continue to be apprised of the efforts of this council and the committee and will need to engage in the discussion and development of a potential solutions directly impacting our organization and our customers. And um, our, our uh, CAGRD committee chair, Alexander Arbolita, has already set those wheels in motion on the committee side just yesterday. So uh, stay tuned for a a parallel effort there to um, uh, further these discussions. Thanks for your time this morning. Thanks, Ted. And uh, as you alluded to, the comprehensive nature of this, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, where we have had and identified some challenges out there, every sector of water user in, in these AMAs is a contributor to some degree to that issue. And we need, as you said, Ted, that holistic approach. And you also brought up uh, problem solving methodology and it builds on Spencer's point. Um, we do need to refine the scope and breadth of the issue. We are gonna have some hard choices to make to address some of the issues. So, um, the further we can refine, identify the magnitude of the issue, the scope, the breadth, the easier it might be to make those hard choices to come up with the actions needed to address those issues. And it's not going to be easy, but if you have a giant problem to solve, it's going to be much harder than if you can identify the refined problem or issue and try to work on solutions there. So, other folks want to weigh in from the council, questions, comments on any of what we've discussed under this agenda topic so far. Tom, this is Cheryl Lombard, if I can just say something real quick. Um, sure. On behalf Cheryl. of Valley Partnership, um, we were signers to um, this other document and, it, you know, we did not take that decision lightly. Um, I'd had many uh, conversations with Warren. Um, and thank you, Warren, for having those long conversations with me. Um, I do appreciate going, building on what Spencer and Ted have said. Um, an important factor was tying all of those papers together. Um, that was important to us, but we feel further fleshing out is important. Um, and we look forward to continuing to participate in this committee and, and working on those holistic solutions. Thanks, Cheryl. And Chuck Podolak has kicked me in the leg and said he wants to speak, so I'll turn it over to Chuck right now. Thanks, Tom. Um, I, I want to thank Tim for the solid work on the committee and, and the leadership. This committee has been very effective, um, not to play favorites, but I think we've seen a lot of work out of this this committee, and I think that's due to the leadership from, from both Tim and Warren. Um, what we have in front of us today is a great draft. Uh, I'll, I'll disagree with Spencer's terminology a little bit. There's, there's not a CAGRID paper. There's a draft paper about multiple aspects of gr both groundwater and renewable water supplies in the active management areas. Um, nothing's published today. Nothing's endorsed today. What we have is a draft of the first stage of outlining issues to look at, and this will be finished when we have solutions and strategies and recommendations. Um, and so. I think it's good that the, the council gets to look at this today, um, but the committee definitely has 
I would say the, the hard work in front of it um, as we go into stage two to, to finish this report. Um, I'll also take issue a little bit with some of the terminology. I don't think we're identifying problems and in, in, in the in the draft document, I think it, it sets out issues and those issues to me are looking forward. We can spend a lot of time looking backward at what's happened and try and argue about the benefits. It's clear that um, the issues that are identified are things that are worth looking at to see if what we're doing right now is going to continue to work decades into the future. Um, there are there are things in the ag sector, the industrial sector, and the municipal sector, both the municipal sector that relies on CAGRD and the municipal sector that, that relies on um, being designated. Uh, all of those have had shown great economic benefits, including CAGRD, to Arizona up to this point. Um, but and I think it's fair to look at all of those, and I think that's what the committee's proposing, is to look at all of those and say, are there changes to any of those that need to be done uh, as we as we move forward? And it, it support all of those people are relying in, in various ways on both renewable supplies and groundwater supplies, and I think it's appropriate to look at all of them. And, um, is one, as Tom pointed out, is, is one issue, or is different aspects of one issue. Um, I, I think um, hopefully the, the, the committee has taken that to heart, that we are, uh, we're not laying out of, of a whole range of issues and then coming back with, with a recommendation on one, one single aspect of that but that they'll um, wrestle with all of these various things, understand how they're tied together, how the renewable water supplies are relied on. A number of sectors are, are tied in together. Um, and so with that, I, Tom, I think this is a, that we, they're in a, this committee is in a really good spot. I think they'll, they'll take back both the, the draft document that the council's seen today, as well as the, the concerns that are raised in, in the letter of the stakeholders um, and uh, keep working. I know there's a there's a huge vacancy there, and hopefully, uh, whoever's going to step up and fill it is is up to the work to uh, to continue the, the hard work of this committee. So, I just wanted to echo those thoughts from the governor's office. So, thanks. Other members of the council like to weigh in. Questions, comments. Director, this is Gail Griffin. Can I add my two cents? Yes, Representative Griffin. You Thank can have you. 25 cents. 25 cents, all right. <laughs> I, I, I agree that CR, CHERD is important and we need to be supporting it. Um, also of concern, of course, is, is my comment before is the exempt wells. And we need to take into consideration and, and support our natural resource industries, the agriculture, the, the mining, uh, and, and the rest of our natural resource industry. So all of that comes into play. And then we have an opportunity with forest management to create more wet water. And so those are the types of things that, that uh, I, I would really like to see added uh, to, uh, to the discussion. Thank you. Who's next from the council? I see that Bass uh -huh, would like to make a comment. Bass, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, again, I'll, I'll bring up the issue of, of the uh, exempt wells that, that, you know, like, like I said, the, and Warren highlighted, he said, if you use a different number, uh, which was the, what I call the asteroid hitting Earth number, that every exempt well is going to pump 10 acre feet, then then the pumping of exempt wells in the Prescott AMA will exceed the balance of the other uses, or even if you use half that number. Um, uh, I think anybody could agree that's not even close to being likely to ever happen. But but once again, that um, uh, to uh, to more succinctly frame uh, the issue, uh, I, I think that. Um, we need to maybe title it a little different, whether that's exempt wells and AMAs or um, uh, exempt wells and problem areas, um, something like that. 
um, is one thing. Then uh, also, uh, I have a little comment about the tab table one that's in the report. Uh, it, it while it shows 2012 to 16, you know, whatever. Bass, sorry, your 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 volume just kind of went down a little bit. Could you speak a little louder so we can all hear? Thanks. Yes, on table one, I have a comment. While it highlights, you know, the uses from the various sectors, agriculture, municipal, industrial, it, it's it's an actual number from 12 to 16, 2012 to 2016. I, I am more interested in the trends rather than just a number. And, and I think if, if we had a uh, a trend from 75 until 2016, um, we would see where uses are trending up or uses are trending down. Um, and those are my comments. Thanks, Bass. Anyone else? Tom? Yes. This, this is Kathy Ferris. I am unable to raise, to get on the chat so i just want to let you know i do would like would like to say something all right you've got a bit of an echo kathy but i think we can hear you clearly enough at least for now okay let me see if i can make that better is this better yes go ahead okay so uh, i would like to first of all thank uh, the co-chairs of this uh, committee, um, Warren and Tom, AMWA staff, ADWR staff, KGRID staff, all of those who work very hard on these issue briefs. They're, they're a lot of work and so much time was spent on them. I've lost count of how many drafts there were, but I know that all of the committee members had an opportunity to comment on every single one of the drafts and so many people did comment. And I know that the chairs and ADWR took those comments to heart and as the drafts progressed, made many, many, many changes. So, and I know they seriously took into consideration my comments, that's how I know that changes were made, but it wasn't just me, it was everyone. Um, not everyone obviously agrees with every statement in every issue brief, but it is to move these forward to the next phase. And as a council member, I support doing that. Um, I think it is, uh, pr it is a productive way of, of uh, addressing uh, what have been identified as potential problems. And um, I would be very disappointed if we if we put these on hold any longer. It's time to start discussing, moving the discussion forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. Next from any council member. Doug Director, Dunham would like to make a comment. Doug Dunham. Doug, you can unmute yourself, hopefully. If you're talking, Doug, we're not hearing you. Yeah. Uh, Doug's having technical difficulties, but it's, well, Doug's maybe trying to work out his technical difficulties. Would anyone else like to speak? Can you hear me? Are you Doug? Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. Shouting into the hurricane there. Um, first of all, I want to um, thank the co-chairs for all of the hard work that they've done. Uh, Tim, um, uh, congratulations, uh, and um, hate to see you go, but uh, completely understand. Um, there has this committee has done a lot of work uh, under really stressful situations, 
Um, the DWR staff has, has been exemplary also. Um, and there has been a lot of work that has been put into this. So um, I just wanted to follow up briefly with um, to make sure that this council understands that there is on several of these papers, um, not consensus, obviously, uh, and that a lot of the points that we have been continually making in great detail have not always been translated and transmitted and made it into the final versions. Um, I appreciate the sense of urgency that other members of the group have expressed. Um, there has, these papers have come together fairly quickly, but I think with that expediency, um, we've missed some nuances and some detail, and that's part of the reason why the, this uh, subgroup has felt the need to present our positions that they haven't been appropriately included. Um, and particularly the, the two papers that were mentioned earlier, uh, both the groundwater in assured water supply and the GRD, um, there's a lot of disagreement um, uh, that there is even a, a big problem to address. Um, and I think there's some more data that we're gonna have to dig into. I am very happy to hear that this, all of these are gonna be bundled together because these issues are interrelated and they're going to uh, have to be looked at holistically. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to, to, to hear that that's the approach moving forward. I do think there's still a lot of work, a lot of digging into more detail of how these things will play together that needs to be done um, that hasn't been fully fully examined yet. Um, but I appreciate all the work that's been done so far, and I look forward to continuing working with, with this group moving forward. Thanks, Doug. And I think, Ted Maxwell, did we see your hand up? Yes, Director, you did. Thank you for the, the for the opportunity. First, I got to thank Tim Tamir for all his hard work on this committee uh, on Tucson Water as well as the DCP. It's been invaluable. And Tim, don't think you're getting that far away in your new position from these issues or others in in our region. So, so thank you for that. This is a obviously a very difficult uh, and probably one of the most inclusive. Um, committees that we've got because it relies on so much. It relies on the outcomes from long term water augmentation committee as well as the DSAL committee. All the work being done in those committees can impact the final solutions. But, Director, I'm going to go back to what you said earlier, and that's issue statements need both sides. And I think that's what we're seeing here. There's just a belief that uh, by a group of significant stakeholders, many who are members of this council, uh, who didn't believe that both sides of the issue was prevented to me, presented. That's to me. The, the issue that we're, we're talking about. I don't think that it not being there by bundling these, their letter and this, the current issue statement is going to prevent this committee from moving forward. Uh, you know, the forward isn't a rush to solutions. The forward's a continued exploration of the problems with then trying to, at some point, identify solutions. But as we know, in the history of Arizona water management, we've been very efficient, very effective, but it's taken time thorough understanding, collaboration, cooperation, agreement. Uh, and I think we're, we're there. The work they've put in has been phenomenal. They've obviously there's been both sides have been been heard. They may not have made it in the final issue statement, but it's important as we move forward to realize that there isn't 100 percent consensus. There's not 100 percent agreement, even on the data that's filling in towards these solutions. So I do think the replacement of, of, of Tim in that co chair, that selection is going to be critical. And I hope that you kind of get both voices. Uh, in those lead roles that will allow this committee to continue to be effective uh, moving forward. It's it, it's the big issue. You know, what's the long term uh, solution and management of Arizona's water supply going to be? And I appreciate all the hard work everybody's put in and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thanks, Ted. Other members of the council. Bill Garfield has commented, not only is it necessary to consider all six issues as a whole, but the work of the long-term water augmentation committee needs to be brought into the discussion. Thanks, Bill. Any others?
Brady Gamage has commented, I also strongly support moving the issues forward without delay. This was a very good report. Thank you, Grady. Moving on to other council members. Ron Doba commented, I must leave for another meeting, but support the issues going back to the committee to develop recommendations. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Next, anyone else? Henry Day has commented, I support moving forward. We'll assist committee with future work. Thanks, Henry. Any other verbal or chat box comments? We do have comments from the public when you're ready for them, Director. We have some additional business to take care of uh, and we're already 15 minutes over our time. And I want to get to, uh, if all the council members have spoken, I want to get to a discussion of replacing Tim. And along those lines, um, Ted Maxwell, I think we are thinking along the same lines. You mentioned that you think the chairs should be reflective of kind of both views that are out there. Um, I want to ask the stakeholder group if they have a volunteer, at least in this first round of discussion. Is there a volunteer from the stakeholder group uh, to replace him as the co-chair of this committee? Tom, this is Cheryl with Valley Partnership. Um, I'd be happy to work with Warren moving forward. I mean, this is obviously an important issue for the real estate development industry, but it's very important for our economic development and, and how our state is viewed. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, I think you probably know how much work this is going to be, so I appreciate you volunteering to take that on. I will just say that I think uh, we have, ten, uh, we have, sorry, Warren, uh, who represents collectively nine or 10 cities, um, who are all essentially designated to have a representative of, as Chuck described, the kind of the undesignated community will lend a lot of balance moving forward as we get into the really hard conversations about what needs to be done. So uh, when we had committee chairs uh, volunteer originally for committees, you know, we did not really have we did not ask for a vote of the council in any way, shape, or form unless there are some serious concerns by any council member. I'm going to accept Cheryl's offer and make her the co-chair. So I guess in that regard, now is the time to speak up. If you do have any serious concerns about the pathway I just laid out. Uh, Director, this is Doug. Yes. Uh, I just want to uh, voice uh, my wholehearted support for Cheryl and uh, express to her my condolences for all the work she's taking on. Thanks, Doug. Anyone else? Positive or concerns? I love positive, but I'll hear concerns. Thank you, Director. Bill Garfield has commented, I support Cheryl as co-chair. Tim has commented, Cheryl will do a great job. Dave Roberts, I support Cheryl as well. Ted Cook, I endorse the selection of Cheryl. Thank you, all of you, for that, those supportive comments. I'll just pause another second. So hearing exclusively positive comments, as I expected would be the case, um, Cheryl, you now have the duty. I will ask you to get together with Warren and plot out uh, strategies to move everything forward as we have heard pretty much 
widespread support to do so. We are willing to help in that regard if you want to have conversations with us as well. Um, and I will then move on to the closing remarks and I'm going to apologize to the public. You can certainly send in some written comments via email to us, but we're 20 minutes over time. There are probably some who need to go on to other business for the day. Uh, and as in the past, we have in other cases run out of time on our agenda for the public. But again, you can submit comments to DWR. Uh, so in closing, I just want to say I really appreciate the robust conversation uh, that we've had today on all of the issues and especially on this last committee. Uh, and I also want to just close by saying the following, and uh, Representative Griffin reminds me almost every time we talk that uh, addressing issues moving forward, looking to the future is a great thing, but let's not forget all the good things all of us in Arizona have done throughout the state for positive water management, and maybe that's best exemplified by the fact that we still are using less water today than we did in 1957. So again, every sector, municipal, industrial, uh, agricultural, et cetera, we've done great things together. Uh, let's not forget to continually point at all the good things we have done and all the great outcomes that they have created for us all. Uh, and I know, as we did in many other forums, uh, that we will find a path forward to take some actions, as Chuck described it, to make sure that for decades into the future we have the same uh, positive outcomes that we are enjoying today from the work of many people in prior decades. So with that, I thank everyone for their attention. We have uh, upcoming meetings June 17th, September 16th, December 9th. We're likely to still be in the virtual world on June 17th. Maybe by September we can get together and see each other face to face again. And I am certainly looking forward to that uh, and appreciate all of the work from all of the committees, the chairs, and everyone who's participated in all of the discussions we had today in this council. So with that, we are adjourned. Quite a few um, 